Hello, everyone. My name is Ruby Danofsky. Um, I work in the Latimer Foundation office. Um, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to, to, to today's lunchtime lecture, Epiphanies in Literature from the New Testament to Philip Larkin with Luke Maxted. Um, we are now halfway through our virtually speaking program of events this summer, and we're hugely um, grateful for the help and generosity of members of, our, of the Latimer community, including our colleagues, parents, alumni, who, without whom none of this is possible. I want to say a big thank you for, to all of you for joining us today and supporting us. And um, many of you have also supported the Bursary's Appeal, which is a key part of our Inspiring Minds campaign. And thank you for all of your donations and everything that you have done for us. By being here with us today, we have raised, um, you have raised 170 pounds. Um, this year has seen a huge increase in um, numbers of people applying for the bursary, for, for bursaries throughout the whole school. And we're delighted that this year's Bursaries Appeal will again be able to fund five new bursaries. Across the school, we'll have 230 um, students in receipt of a bursary. Okay, on to a few housekeeping rules. Um, we're going to put everyone on mute so you can hear the presentation clearly. Um, after the lecture, there will be a Q&A. So please can I ask you to type your question into the comments and send to all. And I will then uh, kind of moderate and call on people to ask questions. And at that point, you can, um, you can unmute yourself. And um, if you put your questions in there, we should be able to avoid duplicates. And Luke will answer as many uh, as he can. Okay, so on to the lecture. So Luke has been a teacher in the English department at here at Latimer since 2017. Uh, before he joined us, Luke worked as a policy advisor under George Osborne and wrote book reviews for the Times Literary Supplement. And in October, he'll begin writing a DPhil at Balliol College, Oxford, the thesis of which is the subject of this lecture. So I do hope you find it interesting and um, over to you. Good afternoon. Welcome to this lunchtime lecture, one of the Latimer Foundation's summer events in support of the Inspiring Minds campaign. I know many of you already, perhaps from parents' evenings or from the Thursday night classes I give in literature and cinema. I teach in Latimer's English department, and as such, on this programme of digital events, mine is the poetry ticket. The subject of my talk is epiphany. That is, the sudden moment of profound realisation, and how English romantic poetry, written from about the 1790s and the secularising age from which it emerged, wrestled epiphany from its religious context, made of it the very purpose of art, and marks our understanding, still today, of what poetic language is for. Now, the Romantic movement of late 18th and 19th century Europe is one we associate with revolution. The French Revolution of 1789, of course, which overthrew a monarchy and established a republic. And the revolution in feeling, the tempestuous cultural revolution against the reason of the Enlightenment, against neoclassical rigidity, against intellect and moral certainty, against empiricism and science and the heroic couplet and topiary, in favour of intuition, in favour of awe, in favour of the rich primitivism of nature and the soul, of the untamed landscape, the spoken language of man, of terror, of medievalism, of conversational poetry, of Napoleon, of the Orient, of the hearth, of friendship, of the stream of smoke rising from a woodland cottage, etc, etc. This was a moment in European history, so the story goes, during which the individual, whether the dignity of the shepherd or the genius of the artist, had its day. There's a particular aspect of the romantic temperament to which I'd like to draw your attention. It's simply this, the artist's agony, as he unknowingly fails to, as he knowingly, my apologies, as he knowingly fails to express the inexpressible. The Enlightenment, which we place from the 1680s, had supposed that using the intellect, we might devise finite solutions that a poet or a philosopher might do to the soul what Newton had done to the stars. But a generation later, the German romantic poet Schlegel said, no, we cannot grasp the sacred. 
he thought that the heroic but inadequate little human could not but deform the ineffable by imposing, however truthfully or beautifully, his language upon it. It's here that, to the romantic mind, lies so much of the pain and the profundity of art. The romantic wishes to convey something immaterial and inexpressible, and has only material expression with which to do so. It follows that poetry, if it's worth a name, must allude to the mystery it cannot grasp. A work of art may be well constructed, but if it doesn't get the unembraceable, then it's deficient. A manicured garden, rather than a mysterious track leading, if not to God, then to his substitute. Further steps, alas, will bring one no closer. The mystery grows as we strive to apprehend it. What a touching medium this makes of words. At their most harmonious, words announce their failure. They are forlorn standings for a muteness they cannot teach. Hence the romantic sentiment that loss is the subject of art. The German poet Novalis imagined this as a quest for the blue flower. One's connection to the boundless, a secular equivalent to unity with God, we must go on failing to articulate. This inexpressibility soon found its vessel, though, in epiphany. Let's leave Romanticism for a moment. The noun epiphany comes to English from the Greek epiphaneia, that is, a manifestation or a striking appearance. In Western Christianity, the epiphany is the feast day that takes place on the 6th of January to celebrate the revelation of God incarnate as Jesus Christ, that is, the visit of the Magi to Bethlehem. Here's the account from Matthew 2 in the King James Bible. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. What to man had been invisible is made flesh. Something as it were up there has turned up down here. This epiphany, the appearance of the Gentiles, the appearance to the Gentiles of the divine, is a staple of Christian art. The painting on the screen is Fra Angelico's The Adoration of the Magi, completed in 1460 by Lippo Lippi of Prato, who is the subject of a dramatic monologue by Robert Browning. Here is El Greco's Dusty Child of 1568. And here's the more luminous infant of Rubens in 1609. 300 years later, in 1927, T.S. Eliot, soon after his conversion to Anglo-Catholicism, put the episode into a dramatic monologue. The journey of the Magi is often recited during Advent and is one of Eliot's five aerial poems. I shall read the poem in full and we shall return to it later. The Journey of the Magi by T.S. Eliot. A cold coming we had of it, just the worst time of the year for a journey, and such a long journey. The ways deep and the weather sharp, the very dead of winter. And the camel's gall, sore footed, refractory, lying down in the melting snow. There were times we regretted the summer palaces on slopes, the terraces, and the silken girls bringing sherbet. Then the camel men, cursing and grumbling and running away and wanting their liquor and women, and the night fires going out and the lack of shelters and the cities hostile and the towns unfriendly and the villages dirty and charging high prices. A hard time we had of it. At the end, we preferred to travel all night, sleeping in snatches with the voices, singing in our ears, saying that this was all folly. Then at dawn, we came to a temperate valley, wet below the snow line, smelling of vegetation. 
with a running stream and a watermill beating the darkness and three trees on the low sky and an old white horse galloped away in the meadow. Then we came to a tavern with vine leaves over the lintel, six hands and open door, dicing for pieces of silver and feet, kicking the empty wineskins. But there was no information. And so we continued and, arriving at evening, not a moment too soon, finding the place. It was, you may say, satisfactory. All this was a long time ago, I remember, and I would do it again. But set down this, set down this, were we led all that way for birth or death? There was a birth, certainly. We had evidence and no doubt. I had seen birth and death and had thought they were different. This birth was hard and bitter agony for us, like death, our death. We returned to our places these kingdoms, but no longer at ease here in the old dispensation, with an alien people clutching their gods. I should be glad of another death. Back to romance. In its secularising climate, far fewer artworks were produced to honour God, far more to honour the might of human creativity. Compare, say, Bach's Matthew's Passion with Beethoven's Third Symphony. And it was under Romanticism that Epiphany was plucked from its theological context and placed in the secular realm of the autobiographical and the artistic. In English poetry, there's no handier example than Wordsworth's prelude. In its opening lines, the poet encounters revelation in the everyday. Oh, there is a blessing in this gentle breeze that blows from the green fields and from the clouds and from the sky. It beats against my cheek and seems half conscious of the joy it gives. Oh, welcome messenger, oh, welcome friend. If I may trust myself, this hour hath brought a gift that consecrates my joy. For I, methought, while the sweet breath of heaven was blowing on my body, felt within a corresponding mild creative breeze, a vital breeze which travelled gently on and the things which it had made and has become a tempest, a redundant energy vexing its own creation. It is a power that does not come unrecognised, a storm which, breaking up a long continued frost, brings with it vernal promises, the hope of active days, of dignity and thought, of prowess in an honourable field, pure passions, virtue, knowledge and delight, the holy life of music and of verse. To the open fields I told a prophecy. Poetic numbers came spontaneously and clothed in priestly robe, my spirit thus singled out as it might seem for holy services. Great hopes were mine, my own voice cheered me and far more the mind's internal echo of the imperfect sound. To both I listened, drawing from them both a cheerful confidence in things to come. Wordsworth mixes religious language, blessing, priestly robe, holy services, with a romantic language of poetic inspiration. The epiphany brought to Wordsworth by the gentle breeze is the rising in him of art. Wordsworth's transformations of life into beauty, his spots of time, are the origin of modern literary epiphany. These are vast, indeterminate. They are the profane revelation that one contains within himself the power to create. And they have become, we seem to believe, the highest ends of imaginative art. Virginia Woolf's moments of being bear a similar load as does Marcel Proust's Souvenir and Volontaire. But it was James Joyce who entered Epiphany into the Dictionary of Literary Terms. Each of the short stories in Dubliners move from the specific to the general. They proceed from a situation toward an epiphany, wherein some apparent irrelevance, the sight of a pillow, makes stir some indefinite knowledge. This is from the boarding house. 
She regarded the pillows for a long time, and the sight of them awakened in her mind secret, amiable memories. She rested the nape of her neck against the cool iron bed rail and fell into a reverie. There was no longer any perturbation visible on her face. Note the similarities between this moment from a portrait of the artist as a young man and the opening of words and the opening of words as prelude. Joyce's alter ego, Stephen Daedalus, is walking along the headland when he hears his school friends chanting his, myth his mythic name. Their banter was not new to him, and now it flattered his mild, proud sovereignty. Now, as never before, his strange name seemed to him a prophecy. So timeless seemed the grey, warm air, so fluid and impersonal his own mood that all ages were as one to him. A moment before, the ghost of the ancient city of the Danes had looked forth through the vesture of the Hazrap city. Now, at the name of the fabulous artificer, he seemed to hear the noise of dim waves and to see a winged form flying above the waves and slowly climbing the air. What did it mean? Was it a quaint device opening a page of some medieval book of prophecies and symbols, a hawk-like man flying sunward above the sea, a prophecy of the end he had been born to serve and had been following through the mists of childhood and boyhood, a symbol of the artist forging anew in his workshop out of the sluggish matter of the earth, a new, soaring, impalpable, imperishable being. His soul had arisen from the grave of boyhood, spurning her grave clothes. Yes, 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 he would create proudly out of the freedom and power of his soul as the great artificer whose name he bore, a living thing, new and soaring and beautiful, impalpable, imperishable. The syllables of those last five adjectives The syllables of those last five words rise from one to five. The language takes off, the prose rises with Stephen's soul from the page and the earth in epiphanic flight. A corporeal vignette, the boys are playing naked in the surf, lifts us from their body, their limbs are corpse white, and into an ethereal stream of the spirit and of creation. Such epiphanies, taught to modern magi, like Joyce by Wordsworth, are not quite incarnations. They visit the individual as atemporal, so timeless, seemed the grey warm air, and enigmatic, he seemed to hear the noise of dim waves, suggestions of truth. Seemed, incidentally, anathema to the Augustan temperament, is a romantic verb. You'll find it everywhere in Wordsworth, seldom in Dryden, everywhere in Updike, seldom in Nipor, etc. And these atemporal and enigmatic suggestions of truth in their abundance over the last 200 years have amounted to a secular prayer book for a devoutly literary readership. What I've said so far is background. In October, I'll begin writing a DPhil at Balliol College in Oxford, in which I'll investigate the link between these secular epiphanies and the negative grammar with which they're so often attempted. It's this that I'd now like to talk to you about. Here are the basics of negative grammar. Simply put, the English language uses affirmatives to express the truth of assertions and negatives to express their falsity. So, William is ice skating, William is not ice skating. We can label this conversion of an affirmative to a negative negation without the voice through trackless fields unbroken cheerfulness serene. Linguists are clear that every natural language possesses at least a means to express clausal negation. I spoke to Mrs Collier about how this works in Greek and Latin. The alpha privative, she tells me, is the prefix a or an before vowels used in Greek and in words borrowed from Greek. Thus we have in English amoral, atypical, anaesthetic. In Latin, 
the cognate prefix is I. Thence we get indomitable, inefficient, impossible. In each case, to negate is to nullify, to invoke the absence of something positive. No surprise that the romantics, fixated on the primitive, the trackless, the unbroken, the too enormous to describe, might rely on this grammar. And indeed, to a perhaps complacent degree, they are reliant upon it. A conspicuous sum of poets and novelists since the late 18th century have used negation, these occasions of loss, at the most ecstatic moments of their work. When their designs are upon abstract truth, romantic stylists for 200 years habitually have turned to syllables that deny or that obscure. So while the Christian epiphany is the descent and manifestation of the Godhead, in romantic epiphany, the inspired poet rises to some nebulous stratum of aesthetic understanding, the verbal inexactness of which depends on negation. Take the unpremeditated art of Shelley's Skylark, which is nature's spontaneous genius. Keats frequently configures his subjects as near inexpressible, unreflecting love, unheard melodies, the world unseen. The ungodly glee of Byron's Child Harold is a more impious strain. But before the late 18th century, this was not really a moment of lit this is not really a mode, sorry, of literary experience. This trope of poetic literature ferrying its reader toward an indeterminate truth expressed negatively is one of many romantic, you may say, inheritances, you may say, defamations. For you'll rarely find the profane epiphany in Renaissance or neoclassical writing. Take Shakespeare's King Lear, which is replete with negation. The play's negatives are not revelatory, though. They don't inspire vague astonishment to speak in purpose, not in the demonic and mistrustful court, is not to set one's soul afloat, it's to lie. No, no, they would not, cries the king in disbelief at his daughter's betrayal. Edgar, I nothing am. What sublimity, that these negatives don't chase our bleary wonderment, they submerge the drama in oblivion. John Milton of Paradise Lost uses plenty of negative prefixes. The unconquerable will of Satan, Shakespeare's unvalued second folio. But far from proto-romantic or in the cause of lyrical amplitude, they are intensive and classically precise. In his notebooks, Coleridge wrote that in Milton, every word is to the purpose. The heaven of Paradise Lost has nothing of the dim nor the timeless. We'd sooner group it with Homer's Olympus or Titania's bedroom than with Keats's glade. The warring angels scour ammunition from the Elysian hillside. We watch pandemonium built. These places do not seem, they are. And take Alexander Pope's negatives. They are tempered with enlightenment empiricism. Through worlds unnumbered, though the God be known, Tis ours to trace him only in our own. Such is Pope's trust in the intellect of man that he can't get through a line that begins with so dreadful a negation as unnumbered without reaffirming human knowledge. Byron, in his satirical and anti-romantic Don June of 1819, joked that the, world, that the word Miltonic would mean sublime. He thereby pointed to the very romantic distortion I've been discussing that of transforming brands of eloquence whose sources were the positivity of classical rhetoric into the democratic magnitude of romantic transport. A modernist considers himself classical rather than romantic. Take the brilliant surfaces of images poetry, the essays of T.E. Hume, and the transformations of classical subject matter in Eliot's The Wasteland and Joyce's Ulysses, Yet we find in modernism an equal reliance upon that exalting and inclusive negation. Its burden is at times metaphysical, at times apocalyptic. 
Joseph Conrad writes in Heart of Darkness that an indifferent landscape is featureless, the delusions of progress senseless, the gloom that broods over civilization motionless. In The Snowman, Wallace Stevens applies the blankest of nouns to he who listens in the snow and nothing himself beholds nothing that is not there and nothing that is. Negations accumulate in a passage to India. Forster's Maribar caves are ecstatic voids, unfrequented, unspeakable, smoother than windless water, bearing no relation to anything. Nothing, nothing attaches to them. Nothing is inside them. And if mankind grew curious and excavated, nothing, nothing would be added to the sum of good and evil. And Eliot's own articulations of a resonant nothingness are similarly well stocked. One of the Wasteland's men sees the hyacinth girl. I could not speak and my eyes failed. I was neither living nor dead and I knew nothing. Into the heart of light, the silence. Odin Lair das Meer. Dark and empty the ocean. Despite Eliot's classicism, he hasn't shed the romantic faith in negation as the grammar of transcendence. So what happened to this romantic trait? In Cool Park in Barely, W.B. Yeats anointed Lady Gregory's set as the last romantics. But I'm more inclined, inclined to agree with John Bailey, who in 1983 applied that title in the LRB to Philip Larkin. Given merely Larkin's public profile of the curmudgeonly bard of bleak estuaries and motorway service stations, this seems scandalous. His Macintoshes and spectacles are some distance from the open collars of Shelley, the oriental robes of Byron. Is it mere provocation to grant him so august a position in this most virile movement? Is it mere provocation to grant him so august a position in this most virile movement? Perverse though it may seem, Philip was gravely romantic, and by enveloping that romanticism in pessimism, art, if you like, he once wrote, he created in his verse a, a coda to romanticism, its swan song and its bastardization. It's this case that I'd like to put to you now. And I'd like to make the claim and to say something about the development of romanticism in the meantime, by considering the plethora of epiphany and negation in Larkin's poetry. I shall do so by setting his uses of negation beside the high romanticism of John Keats. At first glance, and at most glances after that, the poetry of John Keats and of Philip Larkin seem in spirit and in language, and even in their hopes for poetry itself, almost antithetical. The two men were born 127 years apart. Keats lived till 25, Larkin till 63. Keats spent much of his life in Hampstead, Larkin much of his life in Hull. But the most significant difference between them, you'd be forgiven for thinking, are the voices in which they wrote poetry. Keats was the high romantic worshipper of nature, of love and of imagination, a poet of lushness and sensuality who wrote odes about birdsong, the seasons and old Greek pots. Although Larkin is taught in schools and flies off the shelves, his approval ratings are not so consistent. If today's enthusiasm for outrage doesn't come for him, it's only because yesterday's got him first. In the early 90s, Andrew Motion's life and then the selected letters revealed that Larkin knew something about the catharsis of bad words. But even before that, he was known popularly for the coarseness of his style. Keats said that a thing of beauty is a joy forever. Larkin said that books are a load of crap. Keats's most anthologized poem begins, Season of mist and mellow fruitfulness, close bosomed friend of the maturing sun. Larkin's most anthologized poem begins, They fuck you up, your mum and dad. But it doesn't take long in their company to realize, how, to realize how similar they are. Despite their discrepant idioms, 
Larkin, who used low subjects and low words, was really the most Keatsian poet in the main line of English 20th century verse. Keats was born on the 31st of October, 1795 in Morgate. He was the son of an ostler. He grew to be five feet tall, which as well as his livid red hair, he was self-conscious about. And he spent his teenage years doing a lot of reading and some fighting. In his early twenties, he trained as a surgeon before giving that up to become, alongside Lord Byron and Percy Bysshe Shelley, a major figure of the second generation of romantic poets. Though he died in Rome at the age of only 25, the poetry he wrote during the four preceding years is loved by many as chief among the treasures of that miraculous generation. This short man's short life was touched by miracles and misfortunes. An example of the latter is financial. At the age of 21, Keats ought to have inherited his share of, in today's money, £550,000, but the family solicitor neglected to mention it and Keats was forced to cut up corpses in, Guy, in Guy's hospital, and once he quit doing that, to live in debt. And an example of the former of the miracles is the year 1819. The Catholic monarchs had a annus mirabilis, a year of wonders, in 1492, when they defeated Granada and discovered America. Albert Einstein had an annus mirabilis in 1905, when he developed his special theory of relativity. Barcelona Football Club had one in 2009 when they won six trophies, and Keats had one in 1819 when, mostly in April and May, he composed his six great odes on indolence, on melancholy, to psyche, to autumn, to a nightingale, and on a Grecian urn. Larkin was born 103 years later, in Coventry, in the summer of 1922, an Annus Mirabilis of his own. Larkin's father, Sidney, was an in no way anomalous mixture of pragmatism, culture, and light Nazism. He was Coventry City Treasurer, a reader of Thomas Hardy and D.H. Lawrence, and an attendee at two of the Nuremberg rallies. There was a time when the living room shelves of their three-storey house on Manor Road held documents about the city's finances, a volume of Dickens or of Wordsworth, and Sidney's small statue of the Fuhrer, which at the push of a button performed a salute. Philip attended a quiet Oxford during the war and began publishing novels and poetry soon afterwards, all the while establishing a career as a librarian in increasingly unglamorous places. When he arrived from the Shropshire town of Wellington, he, attended, he appended the following to a long piece of doggerel about choosing one's path addressed to life. It appears I'll reside out in Wellington, where everyone's rude and afraid of a nude, and no one has heard of Duke Ellington. Life, you aren't a god, you're a bloody old sod for giving me such an employment. Because in such a bad job, only pulling my knob will bring me the slightest enjoyment. Hardly La Belle Dansons Merci. After Wellington, Leicester and Belfast, Larkin became university librarian at Hull, a post he held until his death in 1985. His seclusion earned him the moniker the Hermit of Hull, and his poetry's demotic pie ends to disappointment, the unofficial laureateship. The poetry of Keats seems an outright contrast to Larkin's work. We find in many of them a desire well known to us from the sonnets of Shakespeare for art to transcend time. Keats wrote of mortality weighing heavily on me like unwilling sleep. But the figures that decorate the Grecian urn shall remain long after old age shall this generation waste. Objects unburdened by mortality, painting, sculpture, poetry, help Keats think beyond his failing body. We seldom encounter in Larkin's verse such eloquence on behalf of art's immortality. The poems of his three major collections, The Less Deceived of 1955, The Wits and Weddings of 1964, and High Windows of 1974, summon the imperfect, the transitory, and the mundane. Middling lives are his subject in Middle England, in the middle of the century. Bedsits, old folks' homes, 
department stores, hospitals, seasides, ambulances. In Keats, it's the world unseen. The song of a bird or the design on a pot invoke bucolic detachment and transcendent ecstasy. In Larkinland, the rooms are lit by 60 watt bulbs, the TV sets jabber and the suits are cheap. In Keats, art transports us through the tender night to the forest din, while in Hull, uncles shout smut, women wear jewellery substitutes, and everyone is discouraged from having children. Take as a convenient example the noun pastoral. Keats describes the countryside on the Grecian urn as follows. Thou silent form doth tease us out of thought as doth eternity cold pastoral. The frozen verdure surpasses the present and thwarts enlightenment reason. Larkin rewrote Keats's countryside scene in his poem here about returning to Hull on the train. A cut price crowd, urban yet simple, dwelling where only salesmen and relations come, with a turbinate and fishy smelling pastoral of ships up streets, the slave museum, tattoo shops, consulates, grim, head-scarved wives, and out beyond its mortgaged, half-built edges, fast-shadowed wheat fields, running high as hedges, isolate villages, where removed lives, loneliness clarifies. For Keats, the pastoral, like the viewless wings of poesy in Ode to a Nightingale, carries him past place and beyond time into the imperishable dimension of art. Whereas for Larkin, it smells of fish. We have travelled from fancy's netherland to a putrid shoreline. Let me start joining these poets back together by telling the famous story of negative capability. In December of 1817, Keats, then 22, was returning from the Christmas pantomime with his friend Charles Wentworth Dilker. On the walk home, Keats wrote in a letter to his brothers George and Tom, he fell into a discussion with Charles on a number of subjects. Several things dovetailed in my mind and at once it struck me what quality went to form a man of achievement, especially in literature, and which Shakespeare possessed so enormously. I mean negative capability. That is, when a man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason, remaining content with half knowledge. These words have become a romantic commonplace. It was Keats's epiphany that a genius in the field of literature, especially the untutored and omniscient Shakespeare, pursues a vision of artistic beauty, even when it leads him into intellectual confusion. Essential to literary achievement, he thought, is a willingness to let what is mysterious or doubtful remain so. What one doesn't know is more vital to one's imagination than what one does. Shakespeare created every human type, was able to understand the every feeling and every motive of every person because he strove for aesthetic truth rather than for the facts. He was able to know so much because he knew so little. Whereas a romantic precursor of Keats is Samuel Taylor Coleridge, author of The Round of the Ancient Mariner, apocryphally no doubt said to be the last person to have read every book printed in England before that became impossible, ruined his chances of Shakespearean greatness by his relentless quest for intelligence. Instead of hunting down knowledge, one ought to give oneself over, Keats thought, to the mysterious beautiful and the unfathomable true. While this may sound like a philosophy of laziness, a command not to find anything out, Keats thought that to not know was one of the most important things about being an artist. Without ignorance, you've no chance. For the great poet, Keats ended his letter to George and Tom, the sense of beauty obliterates all consideration, oh, for a life of sensations rather than of thoughts. Larkin may be our laureate of despondency. Keats is our laureate of ignorance.
and he makes good on not knowing throughout his poems. O to a nightingale begins, my heart aches, and a drowsy numbness pains my sense, as though of hemlock I had drunk, or emptied some dull opiate to the drains. What better way to fend off the intellect than intoxicating the poem speaker? Keats enforces inaccuracy, forgetfulness. He disrupts vision and impairs transparency. The reader's guide is as good as drunk. He's in no state for rational inquiry and as such in the ideal state for poetic inquiry. Addressing the nightingale, Keats continues, thou light-winged dryad of the trees in some melodious plot of beech and green and shadows numberless, singest of summer in full-throated ease. Unspecificity reigns. The cursory adverb sum makes the nightingale's location undetermined. And the moment Keats invokes something so definite as numbers, he negates them with the negative suffix less. Data is requested, but before the word has the chance to end, dismissed. Bird's song, semantically null, is spontaneously beautiful and emitted from incalculable patches of grey. And such deletions continue. In the second stanza, Keats desires blindness, not sight. He wishes he could drink red wine, leave the world unseen and fade away into the forest dim. In the third stanza, he covets the bird's ignorance. Dissolve and quite forget what thou among the leaves hast never known. In the fourth stanza, the wings of poesy are viewless and carry him to a place there where there is no light. And the poem's final couplet makes certain only the absence of certainty. Keats ends with questions, not answers, while incapable of distinguishing between reality and dream, between life and death, and, like Hamlet, in silence. Was it a vision or a waking dream? Fled is that music. Do I wake or sleep? There's no sound in English more expressive of negative capability than un. Its function is to precede any word with that word's negation, the world unseen. Before we know what the adjective is, we know that it doesn't apply. Those two letters amount to the grammatical equivalent of Keats's insistence on not knowing. They provide the poet with absence before he's forced to state what's present. Words that begin with those two letters are conspicuous in Keats's poetry. The first line of Ode on a Grecian Urn reads, Thou still unravished bride of quietness. And the first line of its second stanza reads, Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Ode to Psyche contains some untrodden reading of my mind. Ode on indolence features sense unhaunted and maidens unmeek. In the bright star sonnet, Keats's lover is still unchangeable in sweet unrest. In On Seeing the Elgin Marbles, the poet's heart experiences an undescribable feud. There are many other examples, but proportionally at least, nowhere near so many as there are in Larkin. Quite anti-romantically, I did a little counting. Across the 85 poems contained within Larkin's three major collections, words beginning with the prefix un appear 90 times. In Maiden Name, a girl before her marriage is unfingermarked. In Born Yesterday, happiness is unemphasized. In Church Going, Larkin is an uninformed visitor. Toads has its unspeakable wives. Spring its untaught flower. The meadows and the grass are unhushed and unmolesting. In Talking in Bed, a long married couple with nothing to say to each other anymore can only manage words that are not untrue and not unkind. Larkin recalls reporting to the Dean of St. John's, unbreakfasted. In Dockery and Son and in reference back, he visits his mother and reflects on her unsatisfactory age and his unsatisfactory prime. Elsewhere, the sun is unrecompensed. Youth is undiminished. The 20th century is unarmorial and the inside of a speeding ambulance is an unreachable room. And I can't help but speculate that this syllable, if Larkin knew it or not, had been embedded 
in his ideas about poetry and about his own character from the start. While an undergraduate, Larkin wrote fiction about girls boarding the schools, eventually published under the surreptitious titles Trouble at Willow Gables, Michaelmas Term at St. Bride's and Sugar and Spice. Their libidinous little stories about girls called Margaret and Mafanway, RAF officers named Clive, about stealing from the school's gymnasium fund and about a psychoanalyst called Marie de Prouton, who uses her training to cure a fetish for leather belts. Before sitting his finals, Larkin wrote to his friend Norman Illis to complain that, rather than revising, he was spending all his time writing obscene lesbian novels under the female pseudonym Brunette Coleman. It signifies nothing that I hope it's no coincidence that, long before writing 85 poems whose epiphanies, as we'll see in a moment, are ushered in by inordinate numbers of unwords, Larkin created a new identity for himself with that very hollow syllable, a syllable expressive of both his pessimism and his poetry at its very centre. Brunette Coleman. Only Marie de Prouton could prove it. But the poetry. The Less Deceived is Larkin's first mature collection. It contains 29 poems and 38 words that are modified by the un prefix. In the volume's first poem, Lines on a Young Lady's Photograph Album, the speaker looks through photographs of a woman with whom we presume he's romantically connected. He considers how faithful and disappointing is the art of photography and wonders whether the owner of the album would spot the theft of this one of you bathing. The poem is about the irretrievability and the indifference of the past. As Larkin writes in the sixth stanza, those flowers, that gate, these misty parks and motors lacerate simply by being over. You can track my heart by looking out of date. And then in the poem's final stanza, Larkin describes the effect that a photograph album has on its subject. In short, a past that no one now can share, no matter who's your future, calm and dry, it holds you like a heaven, and you lie unvariably lovely there, smaller and clearer as the years go by. As this poem nears its end, its grammar reduces the, the young lady's identity. Unvariably is the third of the stanza's negations. It follows no one can share in the first line and no matter who's your future in the second. And as we reach the poem's final line, smaller and clearer as the years go by, the date of the photograph becomes more distant. The lady that it captures shrinks, both in size and ambiguity. To remember through photography diminishes both the grandeur and the richness of the photograph. Larkin may invoke heaven in the antepenultimate line, of the poem, it holds you like a heaven, but the negations that crowd that noun, the imprisoning implications of the verb hold and the stasis of lie, bring to mind more the torpor of death than the glory of an afterlife. To Larkin, what photography memorialises is its inability to memorialise. Had Keats been the owner of a Nikon, wouldn't he have thought the same? The clarity it renders is artistically inadequate. The young lady becomes well-defined. She is deprived of her vagueness. Another thing we might note about Unvariably is its position in Larkin's poem. It appears at the very end, and structurally this is typical. Many of Larkin's poems, indeed so many short poems after Romanticism, share a certain movement, which we might call lyric progression. The structure is one that begins specifically and ends generally. Such poems begin with an object or a scene described precisely in language not far from colloquial. In sad steps, the speaker parts thick curtains while groping back to bed after a piss. In reasons for attendance, he walks over to the window of a nightclub to watch the dancers. In the large cool store, he wanders through the men's and then the women's clothing sections of the M&S in Hull. 
These openings are heavy with nouns. The first five stanzas of Mr. Bleeny comprise a mundane list of mundane things. There is a room, its flowered curtains, its sill, its window, its bed, its upright chair, and its 60 watt bulb. The nouns become more and more humdrum, cotton wool, gravy, stoke. This is a hard form of poetry, almost an anti-poetry, a very un tabulation. It seems to contain the facts. Yet in the final two stanzas of Mr. Bleeny, those ugly and undeniable nouns that rise like tower blocks from the landscape of the poem give way to a tone of contemplation, indeed, to an emphatically romantic tone of revelation in which the speaker of the poem realises that his life suffers from the same devastating failings as Mr. Bleeny's. The final two stanzas read, but if he stood and watched the frigid wind tousling the clouds, lay on the fusty bed, telling himself that this was home, and grinned, and shivered, without shaking off the dread that how we live measures our own nature, and at his age, having no more to show than one hired box, should make him pretty sure he wanted no better. I don't know. The poem has cut, become a record of an epiphany. The physical has become metaphysical. The solidity of those earlier nouns has melted into a plain announcement of ignorance. I don't know. Larkin has created a hybrid of welfare state despondency and high romantic ambiguity. Look out for further transitions in Larkin's poem from the firm to the fluid, from conviction to Keats. You'll see it in Love Songs in Age, which begins with a description of some sheet music that a widow finds in her house, one bleached from lying in a sunny place, one marked in circles by a vase of water, and ends with a stark reminder that love had not solved anything in her life and would never have the chance to. The large, cool store begins with lists of clothes, knitwear, summer casuals, hose in browns and greys, maroon and navy and ends with a hymn to difference, full of negation, unearthly love, unreal wishes, natureless in ecstasies. And Arundel too begins with lapidary descriptions of the Earl and Countess lying in stone and ends with a line, what will survive of us is love, that seems aphoristic until we notice that the previous line brands the statement an almost instinct. It is almost true, obscuring it twice. The title poem of High Windows opens with specific and unspeakable profanity and closes in now literally unspeakable ambiguity. And immediately, rather than words, comes the thought of high windows, the sun comprehending glass, and beyond it, the deep blue air that shows nothing, and is nowhere, and is endless. And this same pattern appears in the triumphant title poem of Wits and Weddings, for which Larkin used the stanza Keats created for Ode on the Grecian Urn. Exact details of a train journey, wide farms went by, short shadowed cattle, and canals with floatings of industrial froth, dissolve into a quiet, metaphorical recognition of the bathos that follows life's great moments. And as the tightened brakes took hold, there swelled a sense of falling, like an arrow shower sent out of sight, somewhere becoming rain. Arrows become rain, drama and violence become soft and indistinct, epiphany and artistic rapture are indistinguishable from melancholy. Larkin's career is bookended by negation. At one end of Larkin's trilogy is lines on a young lady's photograph album, and at the other end, the final poem of High Windows, and so the last of all of Larkin's collected poems is The Explosion. 
Larkin wrote the explosion in 1969 after watching a documentary about mining disasters. Its first four stanzas describe the morning of an explosion and the workers making their way to the pit. One man finds some lark's eggs and stows them in the grass. The fifth stanza describes the explosion. In the sixth, we hear part of a sermon. The final two stanzas relate the widow's brief golden visions of their deceased husbands emerging gigantically from the sun, more colossal than they had seemed in life. And in a solitary final line, the miner who stowed the lark's eggs, now a golden giant, shows the eggs to his wife. These little carriers of life in their transition to death were not destroyed. Here's the poem in full. The Explosion. On the day of the explosion, shadows pointed toward the pit head. In the sun, the slag heap slept. Down the lane came men in pit boots, coughing, oath, edged talk and pipe smoke, shouldering off the freshened silence. One chased after rabbits, lost them, came back with a nest of lark's eggs, showed them, lodged them in the grasses. So they passed in beards and moleskins, fathers, brothers, nicknames, laughter, through the tall gates, standing open. At noon there came a tremor. Cows stopped chewing for a second, sun scarfed as in a heat haze dimmed. The dead go on before us, they are sitting in God's house in comfort, we shall see them face to face. Plain as lettering in the chapels, it was said. And for a second, wives saw men of the explosion, larger than in life they managed, gold as on a coin, or walking somehow from the sun towards them, one showing the eggs unbroken. Unbroken, Larkin's final collected word. This poem negotiates the gap between life and death and offers in its unbroken eggs a consoling vision of continuity. The poem moves toward transcendence, the vision of a momentary afterlife, a natural image becomes supernatural, worldly objects, eggs that soon will hatch, join the eternal. Like Shakespeare, who in Sonnet 135 uses will 14 times and with six different meanings, what one wishes to have, as the auxiliary verb indicating futurity, for lust, for the male sex organ, for the female sex organ, and as an abbreviation of William, Larkin, somewhat playfully, somewhat self-mythically, also repurposes his name in his poetry, as in Larking with the maids in the Whitson Weddings. I'm being speculative again, but in the explosion, he specifies that the eggs are lark's eggs. Either it's too sly and banal to be feasible, or we can hear the poet's name in that word. If so, might it be that the poem is a disguised expression of hope for the afterlife of its author's own frail and vulnerable produce? Larkin took a mopish attitude to posterity. What good will it do me when I'm dead? So it would have to be in disguise. But I wonder, if his final collected word communicates his own shy and wholly romantic vision of the unbroken eggs of his poetry, enjoying a golden eternity. It wouldn't be the first time we've overheard a poem talking shop. Some more numbers. Of the 90 uses of the um prefix in Larkin's collected work, 43 occur within the final quarter of the poem. Of those, 15 appear within the final line 
and six of a final word. And it often looks like Larkin sweated a little to get them in. You probably noticed, for instance, about the word unvariably from lines on a young, lady a young lady's photograph album, that it isn't a word. Larkin took the correct form, invariably, and incorrected it. He replaced in with un. He wanted those letters. So why this preponderance of unwords at the crescendos of Larkin's poems? I've spoken about the romantic syllable, its purpose as something that discards, that abolishes certainty, that both grammatically and semantically places loss before gain. And I've spoken about the lyric progression of so much post-romantic poetry, which as they conclude become abstract and metaphysical. It seems to me that the prefix un, a, a grunt of a syllable, signifies in the late romanticism of Larkin, those moments of highest truth, of lyricism and of epiphany. They are the emblems of his grand style, his blue flowers. For Larkin, as for Keats, truth and beauty are indistinguishable from melancholy, and for two of the language's most doleful poets, from death. When Larkin's voice is at its highest pitch, it articulates emptiness and loss. When Larkin's poetry and those recondite conclusions flies to the stratum of Keats's Nightingale, it finds sadness there. And in those uncertain, romantic lines, the sound we're made to pronounce over and over is un, two letters that decrease or remove altogether. And in doing so, draw us closer to, and so, further from the mystery. Unvariable, unfamiliar, unworkable, unspeakable, unrecommended, untaught, unanswerable, unspent, untalkative, unheard, undisturbed, unwholesome, unswept, unmown, uninformed, unnoticed, unlucky, unreal. These are my inklings, but now I have work to do. My default research may very well have Larkin at its end point. His adaptations of epiphany and negation I've always found affecting, but I wonder if his reliance on such techniques is a kind of late romantic decadence, the incessant tacking on of grammatical loss to invoke what can't be said. And the story is a longer one than I've let on. Eric Auerbach in my Mises notices that the author of the New Testament, for example, persistently tasks us with comprehending ourselves in relation to the infinite. In Homer, on the other hand, even the internal world is explained with reference to the concrete and the external. There is no such thing in the Iliad as the darkness of an unilluminated past. The basic impulse, writes Auerbach, of the Homeric style is to represent phenomena as fully externalized, visible and palpable, and completely fixed in their spatial and temporal relations. Nothing must remain hidden and unexpressed. Never is there a form left fragmentary or half illuminated, never a lacuna, never a gap, never a glimpse of unplumbed depths. But I'd like to end today's talk by returning to the three wise men and to T.S. Eliot's Journey of the Magi. Eliot dramatises the very root of epiphany. His, though, is a tale of spiritual rupture, akin with his own or that of the Romantic Age. And so his epiphanies are negative. The road was not as fabled as the painter's habit, nor the revelation so adoring. What the birth gives rise to is death. Were we, were we led all that way for birth or death? There was a birth, certainly. We had evidence and no doubt. I had seen birth and death, but had thought they were different. This birth 
was hard and bitter agony for us, like death, our death. We return to our places, these kingdoms, but no longer at ease here, in the old dispensation, with an alien people clutching their gods. I should be glad of another death. The poem travels from anecdote, a material account of weather and tavern prices, to something, as it were, metaphysical. The antepenultimate line opens on negation, but no longer at ease here. And after invoking the pagan deities of a world made suddenly archaic, a poem of birth ends with death, as does Joyce's The Dead, at the very apex of meaning. The creative impulse has long been associated with the sense of an ending. In that grandest of Dubliners epiphanies, the prose rises as the snow falls, like the descent of their last end. Since Romanticism went searching for the profane epiphany, the affirmative ends of reading have infrequently been packaged in affirmative language. Since Romanticism, the quest for lyricism is fulfilled by metaphors of absence. As in the story of Icarus and Daedalus, Joyce's central myth when formalising his epiphanies, to fly is to fall. I hope these ideas beckon over a few larger questions. I find myself wondering why it is, for instance, one returns to and indeed studies romantic literature. Is the left-leaning reader unable to give up on that period of liberty, equality and fraternity? Does he fancy that studying European idealism might be residually anarchic? Does the more conservative critic dwell on romanticism because he disapproves of it? Does he lament its infantilization of the European mind? Does he continue to stare at the thing he fears, a house spider trapped in a wine glass? And does he like to place that wine glass in the sun? Do the best of us just like poems about flowers? And I've also begun to wonder if some of literature's most thrilling moments amount to an epiphany stuck to the end of a stanza, marked with a few unwords to suggest that nobody knows. Is that an easy manoeuvre, hopelessly unequal to the ordeals of faith and the lucidity of classical art? And I wonder, are religion and classicism more hopeful and positive than romanticism? Does romanticism in the end, proselytise on behalf of a melancholy individualism. And do we live in such a culture now? Thank you very much for listening. I'd be thrilled now to hear your thoughts. Luke, thank you so much for that. Um, My pleasure. Uh, just wanted to say two things. One, uh, we Luke had very kindly pre-recorded that just to make sure that um, his connection where he is at the moment um, uh, wasn't wasn't disturbed. But he's here now in the flesh uh, in a different shirt, as you can see, and um, would be he'd be very happy to answer any questions. So um, what I would ask you to do is just type into the chat if you'd like to ask a question, and then I'll ask you to unmute yourself. So you can go ahead and type into the chat if anyone um, would like to add something to that or ask any questions of any kind. Hello, Luke. Oh, who's that? Hello, is that Robert? Yep. Hi, Robert. I enjoy the talk a lot, and I think you can make a link between your ideas of romantic personal epiphany through negation back mm. to the Middle Ages and to, in the Middle Ages, the approach that they had to what was called negative theology, mm. where you had to accept that God is perfect and immaterial. Therefore, the normal methods of making the inexpressible of God comprehensible to people through symbols, through literature and art and imagery and stained glass and so on, 
was inadequate because uh, mm. if God is perfect, comparisons with things in the physical world are actually doing God down. And therefore, what they believed in was anagogy, which was a theory mm. where you, if God is perfect, you cannot define God in terms of this physical material world. All you can do is to say that what God is not. And the process of saying what God mm. is not helps you to understand what God actually is. And therefore, I think that's distinctly parallel to your idea of um, romantic uh, negative epiphany. Yes, I, I, I agree. Uh, it's, it's a very theological idea. And, and that there's, there's a, um, I forgot the, 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 Greek, the Greek term for um, calling something to attention by saying it doesn't exist. Apophatic. To theolo- yes, exa- exactly. Yeah. So th- that's, that's related to your point, isn't it? That by, yes. by, by, by uh, calling... Apophatic theology is, is another name for negative. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the apophasis, the Greek rhetorical term, has been used in a theological context as, 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 a, as a way of calling forth what can't be said. So mm. it, it's, it's not an interesting... <laughs> this, is, this is what I... The, Frank Komodo wrote a book on the romantic image where he analyzes the, um, the romantic roots of modernism. And what, one of the points he makes is that this, this attempted return to classicism is in fact um, infused with theological ideas, um, and and, and, like, and like you say, the medi- the medievalism um, of apophasis is everywhere in, say, the poetry of Philip Larkin and the poetry of William Wordsworth. So th- this this is the sort of continuity I'd quite like to establish. That and it, it's a commonplace that Romanticism and the the, the sort of secular and artistic um, epiphany sort of replaced um, old notions of religious ecstasy. But that, that, yeah, that, that's, that's the sort of lineage I'd like to draw. And can you relate it also to um, Renaissance tropes uh, like um, Herbert of Cherbury, uh, where he does whole poems which are based around negativeness and darkness? Is he trying to also, uh, unlike his brother, put actually mm. the um, religious experience into this negative tradition? I think so. I, I, have, I haven't read your Herbert. Uh, but I, I, I think he's I the brother of William. That... Sorry, mm, brother, brother of yours. Oh, I see. Um, yes, the 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 um, yeah, uh, absolutely. The, the, you, I, I was thinking of something else. Um, I for, I forgot I for, I forgotten it now. Sorry, Robert. But yes, I, I the, 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 there are there are a thousand occasions. When you when when you look into this of of the experience of um, a, t- a, t- a type of high deflation uh, being being a way of describing something. So so, so for instance, uh, I think that I don't know much about music, but I think the Western musical scale. And and then the, the, there's things like there's a there's a Russian poet um, who wrote a poem called Silence about not expressing, and a little bit like your example. He embodies techniques which reduce expression in the verse. So he created a meter for it, which um, in f- w- w- which is which is better s- spoken. No, sorry, which is better read than spoken. When spoken, it has a clunkiness. When read, it seem- when silent, it seems more appropriate. So I think that lots of these religious attempts, essentially religious attempts, to return to silence, to to to, to define by not defining, etc have marked mm. artistic expressions. And it's a way of, and it's that inevitable inadequacy that the artist feels, I think. Might you also have to relate it to um, Russian suprematist painting and Malevich's um, black squares, because they're the artistic equivalent of silence, yeah. aren't they? Yes, well, indeed, yeah. Well, thank you, Robert. Um, we've got a question from Francis. Um, and I'll just read it out as is, slightly left field. Have you seen to what extent your ideas and analysis are reflected in non-English romantic, romantic literature? I could see some, but not all of your themes in Lermontov and Pushkin, for example. Yes, well, uh, in, in a, uh, of course, I, I, I feel inad- an inadequate it's quite a linguistic project, I suppose, and I and I and I need I need to 
um, get in line the, 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 the way my understanding of how the Germans and the, and the Russians um, compose their negations. Um, Lamontov and, and, and Pushkin, um, let me try to call, call to mind some of it. I mean, in, in, in Pushkin, of, of course, the, 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 they, 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 that romanticism fell in the shadow of this English romanticism, just, just as Ger German romanticism preceded it. And certainly in German romanticism, it's, it's full of this negative impulse. Um, but in the Russian, which slightly followed it, you know, Pushkin, Pushkin wrote, you know, he's full of references to Byron, etc. Eugene Onyegin, for instance. Um, so in Pushkin, I, I, I can't call any examples to mind, though I read, I read a, translation, a new translation of Eugene Onyegin um, not long ago. Um, I'm, sh I'm sure it's full <laughs> of examples like this, because I think this is, this is to some extent related to a temperament, or some sort of um, zeitgeisty desire to, do, to, 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 to restore the power of faith through, through art. Um, Pushkin, of course, that being said, he might be a, a, a figure more similar to Byron. Eugene Onyegin is such a, uh, a sort of bouncy comic poem, uh, more similar to something like the satirical Don Juan, which, like, like Goethe did, turns against romanticism. Um, and Don Juan is not a poem full of negation, whereas an earlier romantic Byron epic like Child, Howell, Pil Child Howell's Pilgrimage, which is a typically romantic poem is absolutely laden with it. But a lot of the time he's sort of impersonating words with as a young man trying, trying, trying to make it famous. Whereas Don, Don Juan is, is a, a much more satirical take and as such more classical. Like Goethe, he, 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 he reverted to that. Um, so I, I, I wonder if, I imagine, I'm guessing here, that the sort of early lyricism of Pushkin um, is more full of these ideas, these inherited ideas of negation, than is a poem like Eugene Onyegin. That's my prediction. Okay, thank you for the question, Francis. We've um, got a question next from Chris, uh, who says, um, immortal, invisible God, only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from, from our eyes. Um, was there uh, where was the Christian tradition going with this? Yes, that, that, that's, well, that's rather reminiscent of Robert's, um, of Robert's comment. Um, that, that, uh, so how, how immortal, invisible, God in your eyes, and light and acceptable, hit from our eyes. Yes, we, I don't know where the Christian tradition was going with it, but I, I know that, I know that um, this is a type of apophatic statement of, of, of um, uh, the, 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 the inexpressible, the, the grander than the human tongue has it. And th this, this, I think, is the, is the sort of romantic quandary, one, one, of, the, one of the romantic um, ideas is, is, is about this inexpressibility where the, the, the artist is simultaneously arrogant and self-confident self, self, um, enough to write art, uh, to, to, to write poetry, etc., to, to, to paint and make music. Um, but embedded in that is always a humility which is, which I think is the secular equivalent of, of him like that. Can I just say what um, interests me, I think it was actually written in 1867. So. Oh, really? Much <laughs> later yes. than yeah. one might have thought from. Yes, yeah. From well then, but, 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 but perhaps, perhaps, not, perhaps not, perhaps not expre expressive of secular tastes in poetry and the, and the poetic lineage. Um, as much as yes, att yes. Attempt, att attempting to be enduring. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Francis, did you want to make another comment? Is Francis here? Sorry, just struggling to unmute. Uh, no, not not really beyond what I put in the chat, which is uh, I'm I, I'm not a great Russian speaker, mm. but I can I can elaborate a bit on that maybe offline. Yes, brilliant. The the, the Russian preface bears. Thank you. Uh, the, 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 I mean, oh, I right. I'm not. I see. Actually, the Yanye Byron, Byron, which is is actually a very powerful poem, and mm. and just having that negative in the in the title itself is yeah. incredibly powerful because it it um it's al it's almost as powerful as having it at the end of the poem. To have it in mm. the title is yeah. is very powerful, and it and it's it's it sets Lermontov's 
uh, stall up to the extent that he he agrees with Byron and 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 resonates with Byron and the extent to which he doesn't because because there's yeah, there's Lemonitoff is quite schizophrenic that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, uh, I think there's a moment in Eugene Onegin as well where Pushkin says um, says this I'm I'm not Byron. He essentially says I'm not Byron. He said he says Byron Byron um, wrote about himself. By, by, Byron's child Harold is essentially autobiographical. And, he's, and he says, uh, 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 he, he makes a comment very pertinent to literature of today. He, he says that I, I, I'm, giving, I'm giving you different, sh I'm giving you shades of personality, I'm giving you a variety of personalities, and I'm writing about others. Whereas Byron was indulging in self-examination and writing only about himself. Um, so but, but perhaps there is some, something of a Russian rebellion against that type of um, the most famous European romantic. Great. We've got time for uh, any last questions. I think Joanna's made a point. Oh. Ah, yes. Maybe Joanna that's says, I was a little puzzled by your dismissal of negation in Shakespeare, particularly King Lear with its repeated trope of nothingness, starting with Cordelia's answer, nothing, to his uh, question about what she can add to the expression. Of life. Yes. Well, I, I think, you see, I, I think it's, not a dis it's a dismissal of Shakespeare as a proto-romantic. Um, because I, I don't think that in a play like King Lear, which yes is is, is one of there's nothingness all over the place exactly in in, in King Lear, um, but I, I don't think it's proto-romantic at all. Uh, as in, I don't think it's to call to mind a vague sense of wonder. I don't think when I, I don't think when that idea is repeated in the play, it is to make a sort of as the romantic poet would have it for our soul to expand into some some sort of indeterminate appreciation of the mystery. I don't quite think that that's what's going on. Um, you know, in, in, in King Lear, it seems that nothingness is not an elevating notion, but a, a depressing one, as it were. It, it pushes the play into oblivion. And this, uh, this, 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 this excessive reference to nothingness in King Lear, I think, sort of submerges us out in the mire, the mire of nothingness, of no meaning, of family relationships and court life having broken down and, and honesty and truth having broken down. So, so uh, n n King Lear could be a sticking point, but I, I think in fact, it's a reasonably decent example of what, of, of, how, of how major writers might have used negation before the romantics turned it into a source of indeterminate um, spectacle. I mean, you, you said that it is a lingu linguistic co concept. So is it very much dependent on specific use of un? My argument? Yes. Um, as, um, as opposed um, to ne negation more widely? No, negation more widely. Ne negation more widely, yeah. Uh, but but I mean, I, I, to, 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 to sort of make my point convincing, um, in this lecture I focus on un mainly. Okay. But you can see this reference to less, etc. And, and any notion of it is so often un. And I, I, like I hinted at, un sort of is an appropriate sound. That that that, 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 that sort of that sort of grunting removal at the beginning of things seems seems to me um, to, to 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 be sort of uh, or, orally dismissive um, as well. Uh, but yes, negate negation needs to be taken in a much broader context um, when I write a hundred thousand words about it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and a big thank you to Luke. That was brilliant. And thank you to everyone for your, um, for your questions. Um, there will be a recording of this um, on our website from next week, if you wanted to watch again. Um, so that is it. Um, oh, there you go. Those are some of the links that you can see in the chat that we've just put up there. Um, so that's our last talk for this week. Um, if you wanted to join us again next week on Wednesday night, former parent Gay Search, who's here with us today, uh, she will be telling the story of her family's involvement in the Portland spy case in the 1960s. One of the most notorious um, uh, of the Cold War, which I've heard, and it's amazing. Um, and on Thursday lunchtime, head of history Johnny White will give a lecture entitled is historical truth a fantasy focusing on the slippery issue of what we mean by objective historical truth? So lots to learn less, uh, next week as well.
and you can find links for signing up for um, for any of those events. Those are in the chat now. Um, another thing to mention is that the head, David Goodhue, is going to be cycling on Sunday. He's going to be cycling 100 miles in aid of the bursaries appeal. Um, as you can imagine, because of um, the pandemic, we've had to cancel lots of our events and it's curtailed a lot of our um, fundraising efforts in person. And um, so David is cycling 100 miles to, to make up the, um, to, to, so we can reach our goal for the bursaries appeal this year. So any support you can give him is, um, is, is really, really welcome. Um, and one final thing to say is that um, from the 3rd of September, Luke will be giving an 11 week course on Zoom on world cinema, which will include Polish, Russian, Japanese, Chinese, Indian, and South Korean. And it's open to everyone. So if you're interested, please contact uh, Gay Search. And again, her email is in the chat. Um, if you want to copy any of the links from the chat, I'll ask you to do so now because once we end, then you won't be able to access those. So um, you can copy and paste any of those links that you like. Again, thank you so much. Really appreciate you joining us. Luke, thank you for your expertise and for joining us today and hope to see you again soon. Thank you.